Hi, everybody. I'm so happy that you're on with us. Um, I'm going to turn off my uh, camera so that uh, we get better bandwidth. Um, I'd like to start tonight. Um, you might be wondering what the Secret Society business is all about. And um, in order to explain all of this, um, I need to give you a little history. And the uh, Red Cross movement, as you probably all know, was established in 9 February 1863 in Geneva, Switzerland by Henri Durand. Uh, most people think Clara Barton was the founder of health services in Red Cross. Uh, but in fact, it was on 21 May of 1881 that she actually founded the American Red Cross. Uh, we received our first con uh, congressional charter in 1900, a second one in 1905, and that was a year after Clara Barton actually resigned from the Red Cross. Our most recent charter was signed in May of 2007. But Red Cross nursing really started with Jane Delano. And so who is Jane Delano, you ask? Well, <clears throat> In uh, January of two, uh, 2010, the first meeting uh, was held of the National Committee on Red Cross Nursing Service, and it was chaired by Jane Delano. More than 370,000 professional Red Cross nurses have enrolled in nursing service since its inception. These nurses volunteered for service in times of war and disaster, and they created programs for emergency response and the advancement of health care in peacetime. In 1918, the name changed to the American National Red Cross Public Health Service. It became one of the most successful con contri uh, contribution contributors to the nation's health care uh, system. The role of the American Red Cross in wartime and peace was formalized by congressional charters, as I said, and um, in response to that, the Red Cross Nursing Service appointed Jane Delano as the director of the nursing service. Among, um, among some of her accomplishments, she created a Red Cross Nurses Reserve in preparation for service with the military in wartime. She expanded nursing into domestic life with educational programs in nursing, in home nursing and first aid. And she established um, a rural nursing service later known as the Town and Country Nursing Program. And that served, uh, that was for the medically underserved communities. So she was a real um, leader in nursing with uh, very forward thinking. So if you fast forward today, until today, um, Red Cross in general has evolved over the years and so has health services. We currently have around 30,000 nurses and other healthcare professionals as part of health services and all other business lines such as service to the armed forces and biomedical. In uh, health services, um, we remain actually a nurse-led model. For many years, we were restricted to first aid protocols requiring a doctor to sign our protocols. In 2000, uh, due to financial issues, um, some of you may remember the re-engineering that went on, uh, Red Cross cut about a thousand paid positions and did away with our chief nurse. Um, at that point, health services was really floundering without a lead, without solid leadership. In 2009, the chief nurse position was reinstated and Sharon Stanley was hired and she was able to move health services forward from first aid protocols uh, to us now being able to practice to the full scope of our licenses as community health nurses. So what does that mean? It means we're not doing acute care, we're not starting IVs, but we do surveillance, we do assessment, um, we do treatments and things that fall under our scope of practice. Um, 
as I mentioned at the start of the, you saw on the slide that um, one of the issues uh, about health services and actually some of the other IDC um, activities is we tend to work in silos. And working in silos is op like operating in a bubble. Um, you get an assignment, you do what you need to do in order to get the job done. And oftentimes there's no need for collaboration. For example, I'm going to use the warehouse as an example. You fill an order, you load it on the truck and off it goes, and you did your job, but you have no idea who will receive the goods, where it will finally end up, and what they might be doing with the supplies you just sent them. So you move on to the next order, you fill it, and load it, and so on. So you don't really have access to people outside of your, um, your activity uh, until maybe you get to dinner and, or the hotel and you see other staff. So this is your downtime. So you're not really working and maybe you're talking about who won the World Series, who you're, you know, telling everybody about your kids, showing pictures. So you're still working in that uh, silo. It's uh, a physical environment as well as the lack of communication. So when you're in that silo, you don't really know what other activities may be doing. Uh, licensure. Um, any of the three IDC activities, which include health, mental health, and spiritual care, um, those volunteers must meet certain licensure or certification requirements for their activities. So this limits who within Red Cross can volunteer in these activities. Because of that, people outside of DHS have they don't bother taking our training, of which there is way too much. Um, but this also leads to the lack of understanding of what we do. And over the years, um, I've had more people ask me, what is it that you do? They, they just have no clue. Um, to be in health services, as you can see on the slide, the qualifications are for a registered nurse, uh, that would include nurse practitioners, um, LVNs or LPNs, depending on your state, EMTs, MDs and DOs, both medical doctors, physician's assistants, and certified nursing assistants. The CNA position is actually a special gap um, where they can only deploy within the state they can only work in the shelters assisting health services unless they have a gap for another position. Uh, so they don't, um, it's not a gap that gets deployed uh, to a DRO, you know, in another region or, any, or another state or division. But they really are nurse extenders in shelters. And so if you have people with a CNA, please encourage them to apply um, with the proviso that uh, when you have a, a local DRO, they can work in the shelter with health services, um, but to remain engaged outside of that, they may want to do DAD or casework or some other activity. Um, again, this leads to an under, a misunderstanding of what we do uh, because people don't take our training um, and I've said for, for years, that's why everybody thinks we're a secret society. We do not have a secret Dakota ring, but as you can see in the picture, we really used to wear capes, so um, we are little heroes. So, I also mentioned uh, on that first slide, confidentiality. Red Cross respects the confidentiality of our clients as well as our staff. When you do shelter registrations, you know that we do not share the information provided to us with other agency, agencies or partners unless they actually consent to it. Um, we require photo releases before we publish photos and that includes staff and clients. 
um, in this day of high tech, this is really critically important. When a little bit of information can be used to look up um, information about you online, steal identities, um, and find out other information, it's really none of their business. Um, we actually, in health services, as well as uh, shelter registration, we actually collect a lot of personal information. So we really protect the confidentiality of our clients and staff when we provide services to them. You might have questions about HIPAA. And uh, HIPAA entities are those that transmit medical information for the purposes of being reimbursed. So most commonly you think of hospitals, clinics, pharmacies, and other healthcare related organizations as being HIPAA entities. They bill insurance companies for the services and uh, that they provide, and only the minimally necessary information is actually shared. Back in the old day, they used to send your whole life history to the insurance company. Now they can only send information pertinent to that visit. So there are provisions within HIPAA that allows those healthcare facilities to provide specific information to Red Cross. And we do have a letter uh, in the DHS toolbox that explains that um, to the healthcare facilities and it cites that, um, that section in HIPAA uh, that would pertain to them. Um, confidentiality is a very big thing in Red Cross, and so we're always asking for privacy. Uh, when a shelter is set up, we want a private area in which to work. So we ask for privacy screens to set up separate areas. We keep our paperwork in binders and keep them out of reach of non-DHS people. And when we do staff health, we document your concerns and what we did. So like our clients, we want to keep your records confidential. Uh, in RC Care, if you do not have one of the IDC gaps, you cannot uh, access our notes. When someone is in a shelter, is ill or injured, we document on a client health record, not in RC Care. That goes into a confidential binder, it's kept out of sight. Um, if it seems like we all hang out together whispering secrets to each other, we're not whispering, we're not talking about you, but we're really speaking softly to, to discuss client issues and, and prove, um, protect their confidentiality. So it seems like everything we do is private and are confidential. So to me, it kind of sounds, it sounds like a secret society, but we really aren't. What we are is we're here to serve you and the clients. Um, by the way, this picture was taken on a DRO and it actually um, shows all of the IDC activities. You have um, mental health, health services, staff health, and spiritual care all represented in there. Um, so feel free to stop by and talk to us because we're really a friendly bunch. So what is, what is it that uh, exactly that we do? So for DAT, um, I know this is about sheltering, but I would be remiss if I didn't mention one of our blue sky activities, because it's one of the ways we prepare for working in shelters. Everything we do in DAT is also done in shelters, except for Integrated Care Condolence Team or ICCT. Uh, because so many of our clients have unmet disaster-related health needs, uh, health services should be deployed to the shelter as soon as possible. Uh, consider that you might want to add DHS to your initial call down when opening a shelter, not just your shelter workers. Um, we know it's important to get somebody to hook up the shelter trailers. We know it's important to get somebody down to the facility for walkthroughs and cot setup. But your health services people need to bring their gear. They need to find a space to work and they need to uh, make sure that the shelter is a safe um, environment. 
So what's wrong with that picture? Um, okay, now that we're in COVID land, um, those cots are definitely way too close together. Um, so when DHS arrives, they should do a walkthrough to make sure there are no fall risks or health hazards. Um, while the feeding people are responsible to ensure the food is at the proper temperature and stored safely and securely, we might be observing for appropriate hand washing of staff and clients. Uh, we do injury and illness, illness assessments. Um, and sometimes when people evacuate, they injure themselves, but with their adrenaline flowing, they don't realize it or they just don't have time to deal with it. So we're going to assess and treat their minor injuries or refer them to a higher level of care. Um, in wildfires, we see a lot of smoke inhalation, most of which is minor. But if you have asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, uh, which includes emphysema, emphysema and chronic bronchitis, um, you may have exacerbations of those um, uh, conditions, in which case we may need to send somebody to the hospital. Uh, as an FYI, uh, we have mostly been wearing surgical masks, N95s or KN95s. But I want to point out that some of the N95s come with a filter on them. And those are not acceptable for use uh, when we have disease, uh, when we're trying to protect from disease such as COVID. The purpose of the filter is to expect, uh, expel the CO2 that you're breathing. But sometimes um, in that, when you, um, when you have cooties, they come out too. So um, having one of those types of uh, uh, N95s is actually no bueno. We don't want to see those in a, in a COVID shelter or a shelter while COVID is around. They are great when we have wildfires so that you can get just a little bit of breathing in, but um, you won't get particulate matter in. So if it's just a wildfire and there's no COVID going on, the filters are okay. Um, now that COVID restrictions have loosened, there is no requirement for a COVID isolation care area. However, COVID is not the only reason we need to plan for isolation care. Most of you with experience who have worked in um, uh, wildfire shelters know that uh, on several of the larger DRs, we've had norovirus outbreaks and those people need to be isolated. So when setting up a shelter, please consider where one can be set up and primary considerations for that uh, include separate restrooms and showers Meals need to be delivered in disposable containers and red bagging requires special and very expensive disposal. Um, sheltering should be prepared to make those arrangements. Um, those resources should be part of your resource list. And if norovirus is the issue, the shelter manager will also need to arrange for cleaning service that's familiar with bio biological waste um, cleaning. So for life-saving measures, uh, the past few years, we have seen the need for the use of Narcan in our shelters. Most health services activities um, or territories have access to Narcan as part of their medication kits. Um, the state of California, um, I don't know about the other states, but in the state of California, there's a special program where we can get the Narcan free of charge and uh, they will replace it once it's expired. Um, so make sure that there is Narcan available. Um, it's a nasal spray that's easy to use and anybody can do it. Um, there are very few things you need to know about Narcan. It is specific for opioid um, overdoses. You can't hurt somebody by giving it to them. 
if they are not an opioid overdose, it's not going to do anything to them. And there is a job tool on the health services toolkit to which you can refer. And there are a lot of training videos on YouTube on how to use Narcan safely. Another item that is on our shelter survey is whether or not an AED is on site. If there is an AED, is it even accessible to us? And how many are there? If this is a mega shelter, how long will it take to get an AED to people doing CPR? So the question I have for you is, do your territories have AEDs? And if not, consider putting them in your budget. Um, they can be brought to the shelter um, to as either the only AEDs or they can be used to supplement uh, AEDs in a very large facility. Um, you never know um, when you're going to need it, but please, if you do not, if you're not up to date on your CPR and AED training, please do it. Um, you may not need it in a shelter, but you never know when you're at a ball game or in the at the mall or in the grocery store when you might need that. So it's a skill that we should all be familiar with. Um, also, as for all those services we provide to DAT, um, there um, we provide them in the shelter a little bit differently. We don't use our C-Care in the shelter, so we have to consider how we're going to do medication replacements. We may use virtual D, uh, DHS, who can use our C-Care, uh, but the shelter residents must have a smartphone and can use an electronic funds transfer, or we must provide them with a CAC. Um, so another question to ask is, can you send CACs out to the shelter for health services and we can have somebody load the, the CAC virtually. Um, and, but we realize in the first days of a shelter opening, uh, we may have to use a mass care procurement card or the shelter manager's P card to pay for medications. Um, using a P card is quite complicated because they have to reconcile their P card and the cost of those prescriptions is not being charged appropriately on the financials on the 5266. Okay, moving right along. Uh, coming to a registration form near you. Uh, this was regarding the CMIST form. And CMIST, what is that? Um, Health Services has always been the one to fill out this form, but it will be coming very soon uh, as part of the registration form. So I want to kind of go through the sections with you so that you are familiar with them and because you may be asking those questions. So far, we have not been told how this is going to work, but um, Hopefully, very soon, we'll get some guidance on this. Um, as you can see in the little tiny CMIST form on the left side of the, the slide, there are two columns. The first column is actually where you're going to check what the issues are. The second column is for the actions that should be taken. I have been told that that column with the actions will not be on the shelter res registration form because um, you're not the ones that are going to be providing um, the solutions. Um, that'll go to health services. Um, not sure, as I said, how this is going to work if health services is supposed to collect registration forms and go cot to cot that way. My suggestion since health services needs the records themselves is that they continue to do the CMIST as they always have um, and then go take the shelter registrations and just indicate on which ones they have needs. Um, again, not sure how this is going to work, but somebody uh, in a higher pay grade will, will send out some guidance. 
Um, if you have specific questions about the form, by the way, reach out to your uh, territory DHS coordinator or your regional DHS program lead for specifics. So the first section is communication. And it, this encompasses several issues. It may be somebody needs, uh, has an interpretation needs or someone is deaf. It could be somebody who does not read and cannot answer questions on forms. Um, and someone who's had a stroke may have impaired ability to speak or process what you're actually saying. Um, so if any of this applies, do not make notes putting down any conditions that um, they have. Let health services meet with the client and um, they will um, take care of those actions. Maintaining health. There are many hidden conditions that a client may be experiencing that are required to keep our clients healthy. And there are many people who have a colostomy or a catheter. Uh, fortunately, their devices are not visible, but unless you ask about their needs, you won't know that they really have a need. So maintaining health, it might be something like uh, they have a food allergy um, or some sort of special cardiac diet or diabetic diet, um, but they also may need to have uh, uh, durable medical equipment or consumable medical equipment um, replaced and uh, they may have issues not related to mobility. Um, also under maintaining health um, are activities of daily living. We want our clients to be as independent in the shelter as they are at home by providing them with the resources that keep them independent at home. So it could be something like uh, ensuring that there's air conditioning or heating depending on climate con conditions. If there's no air conditioning, can we get a fan? The people most affected by temperatures are the frail elderly and infants. Um, frail elderly have difficulty handling extreme temperatures and infants do better when it's cool and not hot. So keep those uh, things in mind. Uh, for independence, um, some items you may not consider off the top of your head uh, that would, would be maybe a lift chair for someone with limited mobility so they can more easily get up from a chair to an upright position. This may be preventing them from going home. So um, people with arthritic conditions or morbid obesity might fit that um, qualification. If it's something they already have, then that's something that we can help replace. Um, devices that help people put on socks or extended shoehorns so they can put their shoes on or some of the odd things that might be needed, but they're very common and easy to obtain. Uh, more commonly, we think of wheelchairs, canes, and walkers, but there are myriad numbers of assistive devices that can make moving from a shelter where there are resources into moving to an, uh, an independent facility or new home. Services, support, and self-determination is the S. Um, people that have caregivers that are paid to assist them in the home are supposed to be uh, coming with them to the shelter to provide those services. But depending on the disaster, they too may be affected. So leaving a client um, without their normal support, it'll be up to us to arrange for a personal care assistant to come in. Um, we would partner with DI or disability integration um, uh, to work with the independent living centers who often can provide services and personnel or resources for us so that we can close the gap on the need. And transportation. Um, back in the day, some dialysis facilities used to provide transportation in certain cases, but I don't know how many of those still do that. Um, and some, but sometimes making a phone call is all that is needed. Uh, if you call them and say they were affected by the disaster, they may be able to arrange transportation. 
there are tr paratransit companies, but many of those are booked well in advance. So if all else fails, we can provide some financial assistance so, uh, so they can maybe get an Uber or something to get them to a medical appointment or um, wherever it is that they, they need to go. Um, so we have ways to do that. And um, uh, that's all I've got for that one. The last section on the CMIST is for housing challenges. And um, this is really important for the res shelter resident transition team. So their goal is to find solutions to help clients transition from the shelter to a new living situation. Resources and referrals um, can be made depending on the need and consider that our clients may be newly homeless. Um, so if, it, if it's a large wildfire, their home may or may not be standing or maybe there are no um, utilities available, even if theirs is the only house on the block still standing. Um, we hope that most people are insured, but housing stock, as you know, is in short supply and usually cost prohibitive. So finding a new living situation is probably the biggest issue facing those whose homes have been lost. So any um, pre-existing homeless challenges um, are really important for the shelter resident team to know. Um, lastly, if there are any actions um, to be taken, um, you either don't identify any needs, you have to contact the shelter manager, uh, or maybe even mental health. And um, if you refer them to an agency, you can put that on there and make other notes. Um, and that's, that's what health services does. So, when should you call disaster health services? When in doubt, call us out. What can we do for you and our clients? So as you can see, I've got the staff listed on the left and clients on the right. Um, if you notice, the first priority listed on an IAP is uh, usually the safety and well-being of the staff. For staff, um, you need to assure that there is uh, staff health assigned to the disaster separate from disaster health services. And this is almost always an afterthought, but staff health needs to be able to itinerate to different sites to evaluate staff for injuries and illness complaints. Um, we don't normally have health services people out at a warehouse or in a kitchen or, um, you know, just out at odd sites. So um, we need to send them there if there's an issue. Um, they'll follow through this, they'll follow the staff through the illness uh, or injury. And should they be sent home from a DRO, if required, they can accompany the staff member home. So we have actually had uh, nurses and mental health um, get on an airplane with, with the staff member, fly to their home airport, meet the family, get on a plane and come back. So uh, that is one of the things that they can do. So if you think that doing all of staff health virtually is a good idea, it is not. You should have people boots on the ground. And um, just like our clients, we carefully guard your uh, information about your condition and it's shared only as necessary for business operations. So if you were gonna be released from the DRO for an injury or illness, we will tell your supervisor for medical reasons, you're going to be released, but we're not gonna tell them why. If you want to tell them, that's your decision, but we're just going to say for medical reasons. And the same is, uh, the same applies if you're told to uh, quarantine or isolate for something else or to stay home and rest for a few days. Um, we're going to just tell them for health reasons, you will be off for the next two days. However, when it comes to COVID, your supervisor will need to know that as we will be doing contact tracing 
to see who you have worked with and maybe expose. So that would be the only thing that um, that we actually will say it's COVID. So reasonable accommodations. Uh, this is something you should request in Blue Skies. And there is a space in Volunteer Connection that you can use to indicate that you require an accommodation. And this could be you need a, a wheelchair or a cane uh, or a walker. Uh, you might have a service animal. Um, you might have special diets. Uh, for whatever reason it is, this should be noted uh, in your volunteer connection profile so that when you're getting ready to deploy workforce can um, reach out to the DRO to ensure that we can accommodate your, your needs. Sometimes due to the severity of the DRO, you, they cannot. Um, for example, if the power is out and you're in a wheelchair and you can't take an elevator, um, we would ask for you to go out on the DRO later when electricity has been restored. Um, because again, we want to ensure that um, you have a safe and secure deployment. Um, if you have questions about a health condition that may be affected by situations on the ground, Staff Health can provide answers or do the research to get you an answer. Um, for example, if you're on immunosuppressive medications, are there communicable diseases uh, such as norovirus, measles, the flu, um, that could be detrimental to your health? If you run out of PPE, um, contact Staff Health. Um, if you've used your last mask or N95 and there are none um, on site, we'll get them to you. Um, if you're hospitalized due to the serious of an illness or injury, we're going to come visit or phone you daily to check on your progress. And we're going to support your recovery based on the recommendations of your treating physician. As a reminder, when you sign your wellness agreement, you sign with the understanding that all health related costs are your responsibility. That being said, we will submit a claim to our workers' comp company, and should they decide to cover your expenses, you will be in re you will be reimbursed, but they are not your primary insurance. For clients, we'll follow up with them the same as we would with you. We also provide wraparound services to ensure unmet disaster-related health needs are met. In most cases, DHS can handle these needs, but sometimes we partner with our uh, disability integration uh, colleagues to obtain necessary DME and follow up services or personal care assistance, uh, such as and also resources and referrals that they can use. So, how do I deploy and stay uh, safe and healthy? Deploy and stay healthy. Uh, the best way is uh, make sure you have all your snacks and medications read readily available. If you're a diabetic, um, if you use insulin, consider buying a Frio pouch. Um, insulin can be kept safely stored at room temperature uh, for 30 days, but if you're going to uh, an area where there is high heat, the Frio pouch will keep your, your insulin at room temperature. So those are some of the things to consider. Um, and make sure that you're in good health when you deploy. Um, some of the things that, that you should consider is what about immunizations? Red Cross does not require them, but um, are recommended to avoid preventable illness. And this is something that you and your healthcare providers should be discussing. Um, I put some of the, uh, the most common uh, uh, vaccine, vaccines on there. The Tdap is your tetanus. Um, it includes a pertussis, hepatitis A and B, um, measles, mumps, rubella, shingles, pneumonia, your annual flu shot, and anything else your healthcare provider may think is going to um, be of value. So um, just remember, COVID has not gone away. Um, 
the Omicron variant is highly contagious, but we're seeing less severe illness. And that's probably because the majority, you know, I, about, I think there's about 70, 75% of the population has been vaccinated uh, with at least two, uh, two jabs. Um, having had the BA1 and BA2 variant may not protect you from the BA4 and BA5 variant. So yes, you can get COVID more than once. Um, make sure you have plenty of PPE with you, carry your COVID antigen tests with you, and be considerate of those around you because you you may not be aware of people that might be at increased risk of illness. And I'm not talking just about our staff because you're gonna say, why did they deploy if it isn't safe for them? I'm talking about our clients and our partners and you may go into a restaurant and expose somebody. So um, if you have not been vaccinated, please reconsider that. Um, and those that are immunized are less likely to have um, severe um, disease requiring hospitalization. Hand washing and hand sanitizer. Um, clean hands are key to staying healthy, not just from COVID, but especially from norovirus, colds, and other communication, uh, communicable diseases. And um, one of the things that uh, you may not realize is that once you open your container of hand sanitizer, the, um, hand, the alcohol starts to evaporate. Uh, rather quickly. So if you have unopened hand sanitizers that are expired and any open ones that have been uh, living at the bottom of your purse for some time, toss them and get new ones. And there are several videos that demonstrate proper hand washing techniques, including one um, uh, that is done in American Sign Language on the CDC website, and I put the link there. Um, and uh, I'm going to give a copy of these slides to uh, Yue and she can post them for you. Uh, wear your mask appropriately. I poached this slide from the internet because it is spot on. If you're using an N95, make sure that the seal is tight on your face. Um, as mentioned at the beginning, N95 uh, N95s with filters are not appropriate for disease prevention, but if you have, and if you have facial hair, an N95 is about as protective as a surgical mask because you won't be able to get a tight seal. But make sure that um, your mask is clean. It fits snugly, but not too tight. Um, it should lay flat against the cheeks, um, should not have any gaps there. Um, so make sure it covers the important parts. And what are those important parts? It should be all the way up to the top of the bridge of your nose and completely under your chin. If your mask keeps dropping below your nose, you're not wearing the right mask. You need to get a better mask. Um, so if you complain that um, your glasses fog up, Put the uh, mask at the top of the bridge of your nose and put the glasses down below that and they will not fog up. Um, don't keep touching your mask. Don't share it. And if there are holes, stains, or it gets moist, throw it out and get a new one. Um, I know in some places they're not always required, but they are definitely healthy. And that, my friends, is the end of my presentation. Uh, do you have any questions? Thank you so much, Diane. We have a very lively chat. Um, I think some of the questions were already answered. I saw several hands went up and it came down as well. Um, we have one question from the very beginning that Scott is asking if DHS Disaster Health Services can put in a note when people go on disaster action team calls to see to say that um, DHS has contact with the clients without releasing any confidential um, 
information. And I believe multiple people in the chat already responded as in, yes, we can go ahead. DHS can go ahead and put in the chat. I mean, not in the chat, in the in the notes section for RC Care to say that they've contacted that. And one of the questions that we ask is, does the DHS require RC Care access in order for them to have the gap? Well, <clears throat> that is likely going to change. Um, it, it's it's currently part of the require, required required uh, training, but not everybody has it, and so they are um, looking at those people without that gap can only work in shelters, and those people with with the training rather um, can do both the shelters as well as uh, virtual and. Um, uh, dat, dat call. So they may drop the requirement and make it recommended. I don't know. They're still talking about that. Got it. Thank you. And several of you mentioned that, you know, to have child, child life volunteers to assist with kids. Um, MJ mentioned that sh um, she has a great app for DNR disaster and religion um, in the app store and they're free. And many people mentioned that the new form, and we'll see what the new form says. You know, several of us saw the um, draft of the new shelter registration form, but we'll we'll see when it really comes out to see, you know, what's the protocol and what's the guidance on the new form. Do we have any questions for Diane? You're able oh. to mute yourself or you know raise your hand or anything. Yes, when Diane, go ahead. Uh, one of the things that uh, I will mention that I just found out because I asked RC Care rollout. When you're in RC Care and you, uh, on that home page where you can see the different services, you can always see the service owner for recovery, but you can never see it for the IDC people. And I asked why that was because we do sign up. And if you go to services and you go to health services, mental health or spiritual care, and you go to that, um, those cases under services, you can see who signed up. But they said because it's uh, IDC is a service line and the service has three activities, they can't put um, uh, a name in because it's actually a group, it's not an activity, it's a, a service. So that's why we're, we're starting to ask people to please indicate in the feed that you're the person that has is making contact 